Welcome to um, the Banking and Consumer Com Affairs Com Subcommittee, and uh, we're not playing Final Jeopardy, but this is our final calendar, and we'll have the categories coming up here pretty soon, but for right now, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Representatives Boyd, Bricken, Camper, Faison, Haston, Lynn, Powell, Vaughn, Chairman Powers. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. And uh, do we have any uh, announcements or personal announcements from any of our members? Any recognition? Okay. Uh, we're going to get to a little bit of uh, homework here and before we get everything started. First of all, item number one, House Bill 709 has been taken off notice and referred to the special calendar. Item number four, House Bill 2205 has been taken off notice. Item number 11, House Bill 1856, has been taken off notice and referred to the special calendar. Item number 16, House Bill 2598, has been taken off notice. And that gets us back on the regular calendar. And so uh, the first one on the regular calendar is actually going to be, if I can find it, item number two. Went right over. Item number two, House Bill 2055 by Chairman Reagan. Chairman Reagan, you are recognized. We've got a motion. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. Chairman Reagan. It's a pleasure to be before you. As all of us know, this is a particularly hectic time of our season, as it were. I bring before you a bill, though. And, and we have an amendment, right? Yes. I, as I was saying, I bring before you a bill that has an amendment on it. Got a motion and a second on the amendment. Drafting code is 15003. And, okay, that's correct. And please explain the amendment. Um, without this amendment, the bill would simply move day-to-day -day operations of the utility consumer advocates over to TPUC. Uh, I thought it made sense to still have the AG retain some ability to weigh in if, if uh, he or staff see something that comes out of TPUC that shouldn't uh, or pardon me, that doesn't seem right. This am amendment allows either the director of the new public advocate office or the attorney general to appeal any ruling that comes out of TPUC that they believe occurred in error. This actually is an improvement on the current oversight as it provides two different independent bodies in state government with the ability to appeal outcomes of these utility cases as opposed to the current practice of having just one. Uh, this is a way for us to move forward with improving the process while holding on to tightening the protection uh, for rate payers. That's basically an explanation of the amendment. Okay. And um, do we have any questions on the amendment? Okay. And yes, Chairman Vaughn. I appreciate the spirit of this amendment, uh, getting going along to get along and working in concert with the AG's office as opposed to uh, being uh, in conflict. And we're all about kumbaya moments here, Chairman Reagan. <laughs> so thank you for bringing this amendment. Yes, uh, as you probably know, I'm not particularly known for those, but I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, anyone else have a question on the amendment? Okay, so we're going to be voting on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, the same. And the amendment passes. Now we're back on the bill as amendment. Chair Chairman Reagan. Thank you. Basically, this bill transfers the Consumer Advocate Division from the Attorney General's Office to the Public Utility Commission's uh, function, and I do this for two reasons. First is to... Uh, shall we say, properly spend taxpayer funds. Currently, in the AG's office, uh, this function is out of the general fund of the Treasury. That is to say the taxpayers are footing the bill for the people doing the work. No, no comments on the quality of the work or anything like that. It's just that the taxpayers are paying for it. Under the bill, as opposed, the users uh, of this system are the ones that are paying for it. Therefore, it comes out from under the taxpayer. And even though the amendment has left some function in the AG, it should be considerably cheaper to the taxpayer. The second, and perhaps I think the more important function, is one of governance. That is to say, the Gen Attorney General's office is a function in our state, not so in some other states, but in our st state, it's in the judicial branch. And the judicial branch is for resolving disputes, uh, the investigation and bringing complaints is an executive level function. By moving this into an executive board, it more closely af uh, aligns itself, in my opinion, with the Tennessee Constitution, Article 2, which says there are three branches of government, 
in section one and section two states that no branch shall interfere with the operations of the other. So this allows the executive level function to be performed by an executive level board with an appeal process for dispute resolution to the AG's office. I'll also mention, as I mentioned in the uh, amendment, the oversight function, which has, is now layered and an improvement. But in addition to that, by putting this into the board, um, it also creates additional oversight in that the uh, Comptroller's Office Audit Division will now be auditing, auditing TPUC to include, they already do that, but this will include now this Consumer Advocate Division. Additionally, because in that cycle, it will come before government operations for our review of that audit and possible corrections of deficiencies. So we actually have increased the layers of oversight in this case by more than just what the amendment said. Uh, there are a number of states, Nebraska and West Virginia have, have implemented this and seen excellent results. Our neighboring states of North Carolina uh, and Georgia are doing that. North Carolina uh, is uh, fairly recent and is in experiencing uh, outstanding results. I will mention, though, that you know this is not across the nation. It's a, a hodgepodge, if you will, a checkerboard of different states doing it different ways. I think this is the right thing for Tennessee to do. Uh, it also creates um, a more efficient process, which to some degree works a little bit that way now. <clears throat> Excuse me. This formalizes it. Uh, if, if you're interested, I will go into detail on it. But essentially, what it does is it funds the uh, dispute resolution, pardon me, dispute, dispute investigation resolution mechanism from the users, uh, uh, that is to say those of the public utility members, and it also requires that they do the first cut at that. Hopefully it's resolved at the lowest level with a minimum cost. If someone has a disagreement with it, as I said earlier in the, in the amendment, it can be appealed, which I think is an improvement on the current system. Okay. Uh, and again, the bill has a lot more detail in it. If you're interested, I'm certainly glad to go into that. Well, th this is our final calendar, and so we're going to wrap it up today. <laughs> so if you don't I'll, care, I stand ready to we, we, questions. We appreciate the brevity. If you don't care, uh, we're going to uh, have you come back up in a few minutes, but right now we're going to go out of session just for a moment, and we have uh, a couple of speakers that are going to be coming up, and then we'll come back to you, Chairman Thanks, Reagan. Sir. Okay. And at this time, we're going to go out of session. We have Attorney General... Herbert Slatery and um, J.P. Urban, and if you all would come forward and state your name and who you're with, uh, we, if you don't care, yeah, either either place you want to go. Uh, we've got three minutes each, and then we'll have a Q and A after that. If you don't care, up to three minutes each. I'm sorry, you you can take less if you want. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. Um, I pre we appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Herbert Slater, Attorney General. I have uh, J.P. Urban with me, who's the deputy of our financial division um, and oversees the consumer advocate division. So thank you for letting us uh, speak to you this morning on this bill. Uh, at the outset, I, I would like to thank uh, Chairman Reagan. We've, we have had, um, I know I've had one um, significant discussion with him and we have had other discussions we appreciate to being able to engage on the bill and frankly we think the bill has some really good aspects to it um, particularly the funding piece i think his idea on funding is is really real work we we have actually it will work in our office because we have a number of positions that are funded by interdepartmental revenues from other departments or other offices you know, across state government, so uh, that it would fit within that structure. But that's a that is a really good change. Um, we, however, um, um, think that the independence of the uh, consumer advocate division in our office is is uh, really significant. So this move is uh, uh, is very significant uh, from a consumer standpoint. We we represent the consumer. We are an advocate function. Um, an advocate function is a judicial function, and we are part of the judiciary. For instance, when we, when we defend your, your legislation, we are an advocate for you. We are an advocate for the consumer, so it fits that way. It's been that way since, since 1995, and uh, we think it's, it's worked uh, significant, very well. Um, these, the companies that, w that are regulated by, the, by TPUC are, um, there are two aspects I really want, want to emphasize to you. 
Number one, they're, they are very large companies. For instance, uh, Duke Energy is the, paramount, is the parent of Piedmont Gas. Uh, their, their market cap as of December, and these are all December numbers, $77 billion. Southern companies, the, par the parent of Chattanooga Gas Company, $68.4 billion. AEP has Kingsport Power, they're $41.46 billion. American Water Works that has Tennessee American Water Company is $32 billion. So these are very sizable companies. The second factor I would like for you to consider is that they are monopolies. They have no competition. So there are not market forces that hold them accountable. Uh, the accountability comes through your regulatory structure. And that's why it's important to have an independent uh, advocate on behalf of the consumer. And we can give you all sorts of statistics about uh, we think we've saved the consumers uh, a lot of money. But this is a real change because you're going to put the, the bill proposes putting the advocate division within TPUC, which is the judicial determination division. So it's, it's like putting a lawyer in an office of suites that includes the judge's chambers. So it's, it, they're, they're really close together. So when people look, they're going to see an apparent conflict uh, because you've got the advocate and you've got the decision maker. Um, the, a more important conflict in our minds is if, there's a, if there is an appeal. And under the bill, the director of the public advocate division determines whether to appeal or not. And uh, so they're going to have to turn around to the commission under whose budget they are and say the commission is wrong and we're going to appeal it. That, that's, diffi that's difficult. That's a difficult decision. Whereas the way it works now is we decide whether it's an independent determination by our office whether to appeal and it goes to the Court of Appeals. Um, so uh, it's the, um, uh, we, think, we think the current system you know, works really well. Um, the, uh, the amendment, um, and this is uh, another piece I would want to emphasize, I don't know time's running short, but the amendment says that we can, uh, that we can appeal, but, um, but our value to, uh, to TPUC, and you can ask them, our value is we build the record on which they make decisions. So we're the ones that take the depositions. We're the ones that collect the financial records. We're the ones that, um, that have the, engage the experts to review the financials. We're the ones that actually negotiate a lot of settlements. So a lot of these things are settled, but we're the ones that do all of that. And what we do is we build a record, and that's, that's the record on which the commission makes a, de a decision. And, that, and any lawyer will tell you that the key to an appeal is a really good record. The way it's proposed in the amendment is that we would come in perhaps, if we ever got notice of something, we would perhaps have the right to appeal, but we are stuck with the record that's already there. So it's kind of like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a quarterback that has to come into the, uh, in the fourth quarter, and the coach hands me a playbook that's a new playbook, and I don't know the plays. We've never practiced them. It, it's, it's brand new. I've ne have had no input into that record. And so, I, so up on appeal, um, our hands would be tied behind our backs, um, uh, what, not being able to, put, uh, to get that record uh, and have that sort of input. We build it now, so we, can, we know exactly what's in the record. And that's going to be a significant disadvantage. And my, our final comment to you is these companies are big, no competition, the regulation should be robust and it should be rigorous. And I think you would want that for your consumers because there are 490,000 uh, households that are covered by this, 63,000 businesses, um, and this is a really, really significant change. So we, would, we thank you for your consideration. We would encourage that, uh, th that, um, that the, the fee piece makes a lot of sense. We've also proposed an amendment to, uh, to uh, Chairman Reagan that uh, ramps up the rulemaking uh, uh, authority of the, um, uh, of the commission, which government ops would have to review. It also incorpor incorporated an annual report that we would make um, to the legislature, which we would be happy to do. Uh, but all of those things, I think, really would work really well together with the funding mechanism. But moving it from our office is, is a place I don't think that it, it's, it's good policy. 
Okay. So thank you for consi thank your you. consideration. Thank you. I hate to cut you off, but because I might need you to represent me sometime. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Time's kind of running out. JP, did you have any comments, or were you just here to answer questions? If you have a, I don't have any independent comments, but I definitely could answer questions. Uh, okay. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, questions from the committee, please. And uh, Chairman Vaughn. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for being here. We, some of us, spent some time this earlier this session learning about the forms of different, all the monopolies that we see in the state and who regulates them and who doesn't. And when we heard a presentation from TPUC, they talked about the various rate making uh, uh, systems that are in place. And one being, a, seem, obviously, this must be pretty litigious if you guys are concerned about building the record. But they've also moved into an alternative rate format. What role do you guys play or your office play in the alternative rate making uh, process that they've, that we believe is a streamlined process? I'll let uh, JP answer that. Sure. Um, so the alternative rate making, most of the, uh, I think four out of five now, um, will have a alternative rate making um, uh, procedure set up at the Public Utility Commission. And the consumer advocate is, is always involved in those cases. We intervene to make sure that um, that uh, expenses are proper or the you know, what's included in rate base is proper. It's, it's a very complex um, technical um, analysis for these, but the alternative rate making becomes sort of mini rate cases. Um, they, they are certainly less of a hard look than a full, full blown rate case, um, and they, they happen annually. So uh, we are involved in all of those cases and analyze them carefully to ensure that um, often multi million dollar rate increases each year. Um, are reasonable, and uh, we, we all, often also uh, settle those cases. So um, I, in my time with the office, I don't think any of them went to hearing, if, if I recall. At least a vast majority of them have settled. So that, that's our role in those. Chairman Vaughn. Thank you. And, and I think that's important for this body to note that, uh, first off, we do, one of the things that we've been trying to keep our eye on is that uh, these utilities that operate in our state are million, hundreds of millions or billions of dollar businesses, and that's something that we, uh, that, that we believe that we've got on the forefront of what we're, what we're attempting to talk about here. But whenever you get into, so if you're, is, so that sounded like you said 80% of your cases were alternative rate making. That's not as a, a burdensome process these days as a standard rate making case. Is that fair to say? Yes, I mean, that we, the General Assembly uh, in 2012 uh, reformed, uh, uh, the, it was the TRA at that point. And then, so that was, a, I think the industry was really happy about that, and, and rightly so. And then you decided to um, put in the alternative rate mechanism, which did simplify things. And so we've, we've, You've taken two really significant steps that really, I think, have benefited the process and benefited industry, and now they want something ad additional. No, I, 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 Vaughn, thank you, and, and and I understand that. I'm, I'm I'm sitting here wondering though whether or not, uh, when you talk about these these cases, that whether we need uh, litigious attorneys or do we need really smart accountants. Uh, looking at the materials, and so uh, that's that's just one man's opinion. And so uh, I, I appreciate y'all being here and, and answering the questions. Though. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any other questions on the committee? Uh, if not, I had one uh, real quick. I guess this would be for the Attorney General. Um, the history of, you mentioned 1995 a while ago, and I'm one of the few people, and I know you do too, remember the Public Service Commission, and mm -hmm. we would elect one from each grand division of the state, and I think it fell under that at, at one time. Mm -hmm. What what was the, is that when it was uh, turned over to your office, and, and what was the intent and the process behind that? Yeah, it was moved, uh, it was moved to our office in 1995, um, and I think the idea would be to, um, well, to take it out of the executive branch. And, and move it over to our office to uh, to have it as an advocate um, advocate arm, you know, on behalf of the consumers. 
And, and that was, it fell under the Public Service Commission before that, is mm -hmm. that correct? Or right. That, that was. And you know, there are only five states that, that do it the way the bill's proposed. I mean, it, the vast majority really have some independence to it. Either they're in the AG offices or they've got separate offices. And there's okay. a reason for that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any, anyone else? If not, we're going to go back in to say thank you all very much for coming thank out. For I would really appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to go back into session. Colonel Reagan, uh, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And by way of explanation, the bill does separate into a different function the uh, dispute resolution mechanism we're talking about. Now, they're still attached in, in that, but that function is intended to be separate. The director is appointed, but the director then is confirmed by this body. And uh, that director has hiring and firing authority for all those that work in that division. So it's, it is quasi-independent in that respect. By way of parallel, the 243 boards and agencies that come before government operations that I see on a routine basis have similar setups in many of the situations. So this is, this is not plowing new ground. This is just taking advantage of uh, that which we've seen work in other places. And I do, while I'm here, let me compliment the Attorney General. I think they've, they've, they've done a good job. It's just that I feel that it's more efficient as well as being better for the taxpayer for this bill to be implemented. I stand ready to answer questions. Chairman Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Chairman Reagan, when I first saw this, I thought this is a, this is a good idea. And at the time we were uh, in full commerce, we were getting, having hearings from TPUC and, and the Comptroller's Office and learning about utilities and, and how we got to where we are. Um, and, and I like some components of your bill. I like the, the, uh, the cost savings to the taxpayers, this new way of funding it. And, and I, I think at it, 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 first glance, it does make sense to streamline it and move it over there. After some of the um, some of the presentations that we've had, and the more I've learned, I, as we've watched the Public Service Commission, you know, get downsized, and Tennessee Regulatory Authority to to TPUC that it is now, I'm not sure that they have the capacity. I, I'm not sure to to handle this, even moving them over there. But the other concern I have is that um, I, I I like the wall of separation uh, for the for the consumer uh, that that the attorney general's office has, and we have traditionally in the last few years moved things over to the attorney general's office, like the consumer protection division that used to be under insurance and commerce, and we found that it was they had a good strong cadre of attorneys over there at the attorney general's office, and and it had more teeth, and so we moved that over there. And and on a side note, the the human rights commission at some point in the future, I would love to see that moved over to the Attorney General's office. And so um, I think w with them advocating for the consumers out there, particularly on these, these uh, uh, rate cases, I think it makes sense to leave them there. Now, uh, like I said, there are components of this bill that I'd like to see incorporated, but, but I, I just want to for the record state that, that as much as I uh, appreciate the, the work and, and thought that you've put into this, I, I do disagree at the heart of it. I, I think the Attorney General's office needs to keep this uh, keep this division and continue the way things are. It was it was uh, I'm sure there was an incredible amount of thought that went into it when they did it uh, back in 1995 and I just think that's the best place uh, for it. I, I think the Attorney General his example of having the attorneys housed right there their offices with the judge is a great example of it and I so I kind of like the way it is. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Okay. Chairman Reagan. Well thank you for your comments there. I, I will point out though as I said this precedent already exists in our state of the 243 boards and agencies. All of them are administratively attached, with two exceptions, TBI and TWRA, are administratively attached to the commissions uh, in the executive branch. And yet we have that wall of separation, if you will, for the investigatory, investigatory functions in there, just like this bill proposes in TPUC. So it, it, we, we, we aren't plowing new ground here, per se. We're just modeling what we've seen work elsewhere here. And again, uh, not at the expense of disputing with someone who may be representing me in the future, uh, I want to say that, that uh, the, uh, the Attorney General's office is spring-loaded by virtue of their background, their training, and their positions towards the, the litigation-type approach and, and driving towards a settlement. Whereas the initial approach, and by the way, that's still on the table. That can still happen. 
under this bill. But what's on the table now is to get it resolved again at a much lower level with much less expense and, dare I say, angst and anguish uh, to those who are participating. So to your point, this bill with the amendment still leaves the Attorney General's office function in place as uh, the final step there. Uh, and again, uh, I shouldn't say the final step because it could still go to court, but in this process th as the final step that they're, they're a part of. I don't think that we're taking it away from them. I just think that we are actually streamlining this process so that the simple, easy to fix problems get fixed first, get fixed most cheaply, and in fact, in the proper place. Chairman Vaughn. And, and uh, Chairman Reagan, I've, I've got to uh, disagree with my colleague. I, I, I was kind of struggling with this until you, your amendment, your amendment actually solved it for me uh, by not eliminating their oversight. I, I think it was going to be a situation to where the, uh, there was a little bit too much in, potential for in, too much independence. I won't say that because I think the people all that participate in this process, whether it be through the Attorney General's office or through TPUC or, or professionals that want the best job for the consumers that they can. So you're I tend to fall with you. Your your amendment uh, scratched whatever itch I had with regards to the process. So thank you for bringing it. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the sponsor? Do we have a question on the bill? Have we got a question on the bill? Okay. All in favor of House Bill? Just lost my place. Two two o five five. Say aye. Aye. All opposed. The ayes have it. The bill moves on to full commerce. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Committee. Good comments. Thank you. Okay, item number three has, is rolled to the hill, so we're going to go to item number four. Let's forget that. Item number four, House Bill 2114 by... Uh, Chairman Eldridge, huh? Motion. I'm sorry. I have gone, I've skipped over here. Item number four is off. Item number five is House Bill 2155. Four, sorry, 2115. We got a motion and a second. And Chairman Eldridge, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there is an amendment uh, going with this bill. It's uh, number 14630. Is that correct? I do not have it in a minute. Hold on just a moment. Okay. Let me check. Okay. Maybe this. Okay. Maybe I, I'm. I'm sorry. Maybe I, I'm looking at it wrong. But I, but uh, we do not have one. I believe. Okay. okay. All right. There, okay. We'll, we'll go, go ahead with what with we you. got there. Sure. All right. Uh, what this bill is asking to do is add to the list of unfair and deceptive practices <clears throat> under Tennessee Code 47.18.104b the advertising of a home warranty to consumers in this state to, or issuing and delivering a home warranty to the consumers in this state without explicitly stating in, write, in written detail what the items are covered and fully paid for by the home warranty. And that, that is the bill. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a couple of minutes in recess and get something legally here straightened Thank out. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.
Okay, we're back in session, and uh, we are on this bill uh, without objection on House Bill 2114. We're going to roll it to the heel of the calendar, and then we'll be back on that, okay? Without objection? Roll to the heel. And the next bill, uh, House Bill 2470, by Chairman Bond. Chairman Bond, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman Powers. I believe there's an amendment. Yes, there is. And uh, what number do you have? 14130. Okay. Got a motion and second on the bill first. And they now we need a motion and second on the amendment. Okay. Okay, motion second. You're on the amendment, if you explain the amendment. Please. Okay, Tennessee has a good conservative budget. We save, we put money into our rainy day fund. Unfortunately, not all Tennessee households have responsible budgets and save, and yet they need savings. They need savings for retirement. They need it for unexpected medical emergencies, maybe for future schooling. CNBC and Vanguard report that Households with members who are 55 to 64 years old have less than $100,000 in their own discretionary savings for retirement. AARP reports that workers who have retirement plans through their employer are 15 times more likely to save than workers who don't have retirement plans offered through their employer. This is a bill that would have the Tennessee Department of the Treasury set up a board to administer retirement accounts for private sector employees that do not currently have retirement accounts through their employers at work. These would be of a defined contribution nature, like a Roth IRA or a Roth 401 or a 403B type account. The contributions to these accounts would be entirely voluntary by the employee the employee would have a IRA mandated minimum or maximum contribution, or they could opt out entirely. And if the employee decided to contribute to these kinds of accounts, they again would do so voluntarily, and it would be done through payroll deduction. Employers would not be permitted to contribute to these accounts. In fact, they wouldn't be allowed to under federal ERISA laws. All the employers would be required to do would be to facilitate the um, the payroll deduction to the Department of the Treasury. The Department of the Treasury would set up these defined contribution type accounts the exact same way that they do for public sector employees who are in the um, optional retirement plan type accounts, not a defined benefit plan like TCRS but a defined contribution plan like the ORP plan. The, um, the board and the treasury would have some administrative expenses. These expenses would be paid for with fees from the accounts the same way retirement accounts are, are cur currently pay administrative costs with these fees. I think a standard rate in the private sector right now is about a quarter of a percent the Tennessee Department of the Treasury manages our ORP accounts for about that same uh, a fee, about that same level. Now, there are, in the interest of full disclosure, there are three states who are already doing something like this, and they're very proud of their plans. They believe they're very successful. Private sector employees uh, who don't have retirement plans through their employers have contributed hundreds of millions of dollars to these plans. But in the interest of full disclosure, the three states that have done this are Oregon, California, and Illinois, and we typically don't want to do anything that those states have done. I just, it's just in the interest of full disclosure, I want you to, to, to know that. But I think that this bill provides a way for Tennessee to really help people in a meaningful way establish a mechanism through which to save so they can prepare for their retirement. In these other states, hundreds of million do millions of dollars have been saved and at a very, very minimal cost to the state of Tennessee. Administrative costs to replicate programs that are already available for public sector employees with those administrative fees being paid for, uh, with those administrative costs being paid for from fees out of the accounts the same way are, are currently occurring. Thank you. And the first thing we need to do is adopt the amendment. So let's have a vote on the amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? 
The amendment is adopted, and we're back on the bill as amended. And Chairman Boyd, uh, you're, you're first up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Representative Baum. I appreciate your, the spirit of what you're wanting to do here and bringing awareness to this issue. People do not save enough money for retirement, and I think there's going to be a, a whole generation that, you know, our parents' generation had pensions. The generation that is, is uh, primarily going to have defined contribution plans are not putting enough in, and they're going to be in for a, uh, a shock when they get to Social Security age. Uh, this bill has been floated multiple times over the years, and, and the uh, uh, financial advisor groups, I don't think they knew you were running this because normally they fill the hallways, and, and usually it never gets actually put on notice. Um, I appreciate your transparency on the three states that have uh, that have done that, and, and my understanding was they don't have the participation that they thought they would in those states. But I generally speaking am, am a, uh, opposed to this idea of the state getting involved in private sector employers or employees' uh, retirement accounts, even if it's voluntary and even if it's a defined contribution plan and there's no matching or anything like that. But the question I would ask you is, if the employees are not saving for it now, they have not gone to their local bank or their local financial advisor or, or anybody like that, or they're not participating in a plan, what what would make them all of a sudden decide to do it uh, with the state of Tennessee? What? These uh, This plan would be for employees who work for employers who don't currently offer plans through work. So there's no mechanism through which an employee would make a, a payroll deduction into a plan that would be managed like TI, AA Cref, or Great West, or Voya, that kind of thing. The, uh, if an employer offers that kind of a plan, then, then this bill would not, would not apply to those employees or those employers because the employer already has a plan. This bill would just apply to employees who work in the private sector for an employer who does not offer anything. This would provide a way for employees to make those contributions with a payroll deduction into a plan that's managed with certain accounts that are uh, earmarked for growth or international investing or, or value investing in a way that employees currently don't have available. Okay, uh, Chairman Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, and so I, I appreciate what you're trying to do here. I, and when I spoke to a group one time that was very much opposed to this, I told them, I said, you know, it, we, it, it's not going to happen. I, I agree with you on that. But my challenge to them was it, we've identified these people out here that don't have retirement accounts. And, and they can go to a, to a bank or to a financial planner. They don't have to have a group retirement plan to participate. They can do a Roth IRA or traditional IRA. Uh, you know, they're... they're uh, uh, simple plans. There's a lot of things that, that uh, these folks could participate in. And so my challenge to anybody that can hear my voice, if you are in that industry, is we need to be reaching out to these people. Uh, and, and we need to be enrolling them in retirement plans and doing our part, uh, it, folks that are in the insurance and the financial services industry. But I, um, I want to, as politely as I can, thank you for bringing awareness to this issue and for your passion for it. I will be opposing this bill, but I, I like the spirit of what you're trying to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and um, Representative Lynn, you're next. I, I think I'm just going to echo what Chairman Boyd said, and I truly appreciate your heart. I, we all realize that we don't save enough in society. People are not saving enough, and we really need to train our children to uh, be savers for the future. But I, I just don't think it would be a good idea to compete with the private sector like this, for government to compete with the private sector. Um, really, government should just do those things that people can't do themselves. Um, and uh, people can do these things themselves. You, you can have a deduction, uh, ACH, from your checking account to an investment account somewhere if you so wanted to and save, just like uh, Representative Boyd was saying. So. I just um, also feel like there might be some folks who feel a little suspect that government is kind of holding their money uh, for them. I, it just doesn't have a, a, a good taste. Uh, so for that reason, too, those reasons, I, I also will be opposing this bill. But thank you. I, I think you've raised an issue that's very important. Thank you, uh, Chairman Bricken. Oh. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief because I concur with my colleagues on their comments. I will add from, uh, from the banking sector, I mean, financial literacy, and this kind of comes under that financial literacy umbrella, we certainly need to put more resources into educating our public. And if there was a bill to, for the Tennessee to s provide more resources in public education, uh, handouts to em employees that are not participating in plans to make them, try to make them aware of time marches on. And everybody thinks they can catch up in the last few years prior to retirement. And, we know that just doesn't work. So, again, I, I would certainly encourage another bill coming back to put some more resources in education in this area. So, that, with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. And Leader Camper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative, for bringing this bill. I actually think it's a good bill. I think what the um, my colleague just mentioned about financial literacy is a concern in this state. And I feel that our treasury, um, treasurer has a great amount of credibility across the state. He's been in schools and all across the state where uh, he's talked about the investments of the state, the, the Tennessee Stars program. So there's a level of comfort in dealing with someone like the treasury and the state of Tennessee based on how we've been very conservative with how we uh, manage money in this state. We have also here in the state of Tennessee a lot of people that are caught in this eternal uh, temporary work, where they may work on an assignment on a temporary basis for six months, they don't get any benefits, and then they, you know, they have to take a break because they could possibly be full time, and then they have to go back. So I think this provides an opportunity for them to. Um, make a decision to uh, put some money aside, knowing that it will be managed very uh, conservatively and that they feel a level of comfort. And, and because um, investments are so complicated and a lot of people fear that they're gonna make the wrong decision, they may not go to a traditional bank or, tr uh, or to some broker because they have this level of uncertainty so they're afraid to make the investment. And I think that we've demonstrated uh, how how uh, very methodical we've been in this state about uh, uh, managing money and investments and return. You can look at the uh, status that we have right now with how much uh, 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 surplus we have in this state because of how great we've been doing. Uh, so I think it's a good bill. I'm going to vote for it, and I hope we can um, uh, continue the conversation, move it forward. Uh, and continue the conversation. If people have some reservations, maybe we could do something to fix it as they go to full committee. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for gig workers and people that just don't have these benefits available to them and will love the opportunity. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this bill. I just respond to some of the comments. First of all, I think our Tennessee General Assembly is on the right track. We have designated October as Financial Literacy Month. But in addition to that, in the field of behavioral economics, there's a theory called nudge theory, which means about like what it <laughs> says. People are pretty ambivalent or indifferent to a lot of decisions they have to make in life. And if you just nudge them in the right direction, they're more than happy to do things that are, that are beneficial to them. How that translates into this situation is if an employee has the option to just simply check a box and have a part of their payroll deduction be sent to some kind of a defined contribution account that will be managed and, investment and invested, they're happy to do it. But if they've got to take their time, get in the car, shop around, drive to a, a bank to find an, in, an investor, fill out the paperwork to make contributions come directly out of their account, that's just enough of a barrier that lots of people don't do it. And then what we find is when they have a medical emergency or they need to retire, they don't have the resources that they need, and then it's society at large that bears a portion of those costs. According to nudge theory, if you just provide these individuals with the form where all they have to do is agree to the contribution, most people are, are happy to do it. Thank you. Chairman Vaughn. And that's that you got to the you kind of talked around the point that I'm curious about uh, in this is that why these folks already have access 
to be able to save money, invest money, re put together a retirement plan, whether it be through an independent broker or savings account or, or whatever, what's going to make this plan work as opposed to the things that they've already decided that they were not going to participate in? Chairman Bond. It may have a little bit to do with the answer that I just gave. It just facilitates the process. It makes it easy. It makes it seem reputable. Again, the Tennessee Treasurer's administering the money. It, it seems legitimate. At any rate, I can tell you this. The states that have adopted these plans, only three, but in, the, in these states, literally hundreds of millions of dollars have been contributed into these kinds of accounts. So that provides some evidence that when given the option, employees whose employers do not offer these kinds of retirement plans are taking advantage of them. Chairman, are you there? All right. I, I appreciate it. I, uh, it's a very interesting concept. One, I, I tend to, uh, well, no, I, I do not like it when government gets in and displaces private enterprises from being in the marketplace. But it is, a, 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 your heart's in the right place, I can tell, and you're a lot, really, really smart guy. And I know that you would see this through to make sure that it worked. It's just something that I'm, I'm struggling with myself. But thank you. Thank you, Chairman Ron. Did thank, you have a thank comment? You. Okay. Um, Representative Powell. Uh, thank you, and I also want to thank you for the bill. Um, and, and I appreciate your thoughts on, I guess, the nudge theory. Um, it seems to me like if we got more people that got in the habit of saving, um, it would actually benefit private sector because they might, you know, look and understand that um, the benefits from having these managed accounts and might look for other opportunities as well. But I think that for a lot of these uh, employees, um, quite frankly, they are probably at a lower income bracket um, and, and maybe not as attractive to um, these different brokers that are out there to try to recruit them uh, to save. Uh, and so I think that anything we can do as a state to create savings uh, for people uh, ultimately will be a great benefit not only to Tennesseans but the state as a whole because what happens, as you pointed out, is when people don't have these savings and these accounts in place as they near retirement or they near um, as, they, as they approach different health crises that might exist, um, what ends up happening is the state ends up bearing that burden, uh, as we know. And so I think this is a very, um, you know, prudent manner to go about doing this. I think it's very fiscally responsible uh, that's going to help save the state a lot of money in the long run, not only help Tennesseans save money, but help the state of Tennessee save a lot of money. So I appreciate you bringing this bill, and I would just say, um, you know, I hope, and this has been said, but that these, these entities that are out there that are, have these accounts will continue to not just, you know, the, the high dollar, the high dollar, high net worth individuals are great, but it's the the um, average worker, the um, person that that really needs us the most, that it will benefit the most, and I think ultimately, that's what government should be in the business of, of doing is helping make sure that we serve all Tennesseans uh, who might not have access to something otherwise. Thank you. Chairman Bond. I, I think you're right, uh, Representative Powell. There's lots of low-income workers who, for whatever reason, do not elect to save on their own. And I should add that even though we've only been talking about the benefits to the employees, there are certain benefits to the employers in this bill that don't currently offer retirement plans in that they're able to recruit workers without saying, we don't offer a retirement benefit. Now, they offer, then they would offer a retirement benefit. It would sort of help them level the playing field with other employers that do offer their own retirement plans. This could be particularly important in today's economy where we have a labor shortage. This bill would benefit these employers who are not currently offering retirement accounts by being able, they could claim that they actually do provide uh, retirement benefits, be through the Department of the Treasury, but those benefits would be available. Thank you. Representative Flynn. When you just mentioned the nudge theory, it sounded like you were saying that when someone is hired, along with their onboarding papers, they would be offered a paper to sign up to participate in this program. Is that what you were saying? Yes. Chairman Bond. Oh, thank you, 
Chairman Powers, <coughs> when hired, mm -hmm. if an employer wouldn't, uh, wouldn't otherwise offer this kind of defined contribution retirement plan, mm -hmm. this bill would allow the employer to offer this benefit through payroll deduction all the employee would have to do would be to indicate on the kind of paperwork you reference when first hired that they're mm -hmm. interested in making a contribution. Nudge theory suggests mm -hmm. that when things are made easy like that, you're going through a piece of paper and you're checking whether you want dental benefits and vision benefits and long-term disability benefits. If it's as simple as checking a box saying, yes, I wanna have 5% of my payroll deducted and sent into this retirement account, People are really happy to do it, but it's when the barrier is as large as shopping around, getting in the car, finding an investment advisor, taking the afternoon to do it, filling out what would probably be a lot more in the form of paperwork. That's just enough of a barrier that lots of people uh, aren't willing to go through the process to do it on their own. Representative Lynn. The thing that concerns me greatly about that idea is um, that really puts the government in direct competition with, um, you know, private businesses that offer uh, retirement accounts and the maintenance of retirement accounts. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice <laughs> if you were a private business to, uh, you know, have uh, when everybody's onboarded to have that there every single time um, because this really isn't the company's retirement plan. Really, this is the employee's, and an employee can really go get a retirement plan uh, with any company and have uh, deduction from their checking account uh, to any company. It just, it feels to me like an unfair competitive advantage with the private sector under the guise of, um, you know, of, of it being government of it being government, other uh, other uh, businesses aren't having the same advantage of having that offered at the same time. It it just doesn't feel right. And um, like I said, I, I I think you're you're right on point that people are not saving enough, and they need to save. They need to save. Um, but. It, it just really doesn't feel right to me for the government to be doing this. So thank you. Chairman Bond, did you have a, got a question on the bill? Question on the bill. Question's been called. Without objection. We're going to be voting on House Bill 2470. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. No. Looks like the no's have it. Sorry, Chairman Bond. Thank you all. Bill fails. Thank you for your work on this. House Bill 2473, I'm sorry, 2733, by Chairman Wendell. Chairman Wendell, you're almost late, but you're here. Glad to have you. And I think you have it. Did you have an amendment on the bill, too? Sure. Got a motion and a second on the amendment. And we're, uh, do I need to do that? No. Then we're on the amendment right now. The amendment was offered by... Governor Lee's office, I accepted the amendment. Uh, this amends the bill that allows veterans uh, the possibility of a day off on Veterans Day. If they request a day off at the discretion of the employer, they'll get Veterans Day off. And I'd appreciate your consideration. But what's your drafting code on that, please? Drafting code on that is, is it 014653? That's what we have. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we're going to be voting on the amendment right now to put it on the bill. All in favor say aye. All opposed? The amendment goes on the bill, and did you have any other comments on the bill? Thank or you very amendment? much for your consideration. I appreciate it. This is okay. for our veterans. I'd appreciate your help. And Representative Lynn, we have a question. I didn't, I didn't really understand your explanation of the bill. Couldn't um, any employee right now request the day off from their employer for Veterans Day and, and, and get the day off, you know, as they have PTO or whatever? That's Chairman Wendell. Point. And, and the bill, as originally drafted, would have given no discretion to the employer, but I accepted Governor Lee's amendment. I, I'm not totally pleased with it, but it, it uh, dilutes the bill and makes it permissive. And my preference would be that a veteran should be allowed to have Veterans Day off 
at their own discretion, not the discretion of the employer, but this bill, you correctly point out, is at the discretion of the employer. So it certainly dilutes the bill and makes it permissive. Representative Flynn. So basically, as amended, the bill is basically codifying something that already, is a, a, a situation that already exists. Anybody can, any veteran can go to their certainly. employer and say, I would like Veterans Day off and, um, you know, use your PTO or whatever. And, and I think that's a fair assessment. Chairman and, Wendell. Uh, that was not my regional bill. The <coughs> governor's office mm -hmm. did not wish for, for veterans to have the option to have the day off. So I accepted the amendment at the request of the governor's office. But you oh. are right. This amendment certainly weakens the rights of veterans for the day mm -hmm. off. It does. You're, you're correct. Sorry. Representative Lynn. Um, it almost reminds me of the... Um, the opposition uh, in, in opposition by our forefathers um, to the amendments to the Constitution, they feared, you know, they, they felt that our Constitution gave the citizens all rights. It gave the citizens the right to bear arms, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion. There was no reason to restate it in the amendments, and what they feared was is that people would assume that those rights are coming to them from government and that th those were the only rights that they had. And it kind of reminds me of that. Um, this is, it's kind of feeling like that. Um, that people would think that their ability to ask for the day off for Veterans Day if you're a veteran is coming from government, not just from themselves. So I, I don't know that it's working the way maybe you hope. Well, I'm not satisfied with Chairman the Wendell. language of the amendment. Clearly, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. And if you want to make an amendment to put it back to the original format, I will accept your amendment. I'll consider it a friendly amendment, and we'll go back to the original bill, and we'll try to pass it as it was. But I did make an agreement with Governor Lee's office that we would put this to make it permissive with the employer. And I understand uh, where they're coming from and uh, from a philosophical standpoint, but if Karen Camper served her country in the United States Army for 25 plus years, and it's Veterans Day, and she wants to spend that day with her family. I think she ought to be allowed to, and that's the purpose of the bill. But right. uh, and I also understand the other side that uh, we shouldn't be dictating employers what they can or can't do. And the bill, as if you accept this amendment, is permissive, and they don't get paid for the day off. This is if Karen Camper wants to take the day off. She does not get paid, and she gets to spend that day with her family. But I certainly understand what your your position, and I don't uh, totally disagree with you. Okay. And um, are you, you know, okay, we're going to go out of session in just a minute. She's going to, uh, legal is going to talk to us about what the discretion, right. what that and is. And if you don't accept the amendment, we're back on the bill. Yeah, okay. Is this really drafted? Okay, now? we're going to go back and talk about that. Uh, we're going to go out of session. And Jamie Shanks, Office of Legal Services. The amendment that you've adopted, what it provides is says that an employer shall allow the uh, veteran employees to have Veterans Day as a non-paid holiday if, first, the employee provides at least one month's written notice, two, the employee provides proof of veteran status, and number three, which is the discretionary part, provides um, that the employee's absence, either alone or in combination with other em veteran employees' absences, on that day will not impact public health or safety or cause the employer significant economic or operational disruption as determined by the employer in the employer's sole discretion. So that last component is what is in the employer's sole discretion. Thank you. I'm back into session, and do we have any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Then we're going to go back out of session. And we got a question for legal. So I'm a little unclear. So the employer, as long as the employee is a veteran, provides proof of veteran status, the employer shall give the person the day off? As long as there's the one month's notice, proof of veteran status, and that the absence, either alone or with other veterans, would not cause the uh, significant economic or safety or health um, problems and that determination would be within the employer's sole discretion. Right. Otherwise, however, any employee who is a veteran and wants the day off on Veterans Day can simply put in PTO and get the day off and they don't have to provide proof that they're a veteran or anything else. They can just, you know, request that day off 
as anybody might request a day off. You're asking if an, employ if an employee outside of this just asked right. the employer, may I have the day off? And then the employer right. at their own discretion would give them the day off. I believe this doesn't interfere with that. And this bill as amended also says um, that this doesn't prohibit an employer from allowing the employees to have the day as a paid holiday either. So. Well, what I think what I'm really saying is, is this the one and only day where an employee is actually gonna have to provide proof of their reason for wanting a day off? I think that's what I'm saying. Is this the one and only day we're going to codify this in law where an employee is going to have to pr provide proof for their wanting a day off? I can't speak to that. Of, okay. Okay, we're going to go back into session unless there are any other questions for legal. And uh, did you have a comment or we're going to Chairman Bricken or do you have any? Appreciate your consideration. Thank okay, you. Okay, yeah, Chairman Bricken. Question on the amendment and or the bill. Oh, the bill. Yeah, we're, all, we're on the bill. Okay. So, question on the bill. Okay, we're going to be voting on House Bill 2733. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. And you are going to be sent to uh, state and local government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Appreciate I'm sorry. Um, sorry, sent to Commerce Full. Sorry. Uh, Chairman Faison, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee, with your indulgence, I'd like to take a personal privilege. My daughter, Becca, is in here. She looks just like me. Y'all make her feel welcome. Thank you for coming today. Chairman Hawk. Um, this is House Bill 375. Chairman Hawk, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. And I'm not sure whether to ask for a day off or to try to nudge the committee on House Bill 375, but I would certainly appreciate a motion in a second. We need a 30-day notice if you get a day off. Got a motion and a second. Do we have an amendment? Yes, we do have an amendment. And that number? Thank you. We do have an amendment. It's uh, code 014943. It is uh, essentially making this an effective date for this calendar year. And we need a motion and a second on that. And a second. I got a motion and a second. So all in favor of the House amendment, vote aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. We're back on the bill as amended. Chairman Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. I I'd like each of you to go back in time to when you first decided to run for office and what was on your mind at the time. And on my mind at the time, 22 years ago, was the frustration I was feeling with some governmental entities. I was in the retail business. And we, as retailers and other businesses across the state of Tennessee, we are the point of tax collection on sales taxes. And at that point in time, we were, businesses were receiving roughly a 2% a rebate on vendors' compensation, on sales tax collection. We called it vendors' compensation. On the first $2,500 of taxes collected, sales taxes collected, it was 50 bucks. It wasn't much. It really wasn't enough to cover your expenses, but it at least made it less painful uh, to be the tax collector for the state of Tennessee. Fast forward to some years where the income tax debate was going on. Those vendors' compensation dollars went down to 1%, $25 a month, and then they went down to zero. Fast forward to where we are now in this day and time, just about every, and I won't pull my credit card out, but, or my debit card out, but, uh, so nobody can see the number. And just it's give us your prompt, number. Yeah. But, but now business largely is done with a swipe of a debit card or a credit card. Seven million Tennesseans, roughly five and a half million Tennesseans, either through themselves or through their family, they have some type of credit or debit card. <laughs> And they'll use it at least once a day. The majority of these transactions that we have that are collecting sales taxes are used by, are utilized uh, in a credit card, debit card swipe. So what this legislation discusses, and this is not the first time it's come before you, but what this legislation discusses is that 
we're fine with keeping the swipe fee. Now there is a fee for every time that swipe goes through. It can be anywhere between two and four percent. That is collected by the uh, by the uh, uh, the credit card issuer, the credit card companies, in order for the for the company, for the business, the retailer, to use their machineries to accept credit cards. Hope I hope I explained that correctly. So the three, the two to three percent they were charging on the item that's purchased, or the meal, or the hotel room, whatever that is, we're fine with that being on the cost of the of the product, the hundred dollar item that may be purchased. Swipe fee's fine. The two to four percent on the swipe fee for that hundred dollars is fine, but the pass through cost of the sales taxes, that's the conundrum that we've got, because the swipe fee on the sales tax is not something that the business has the ability to mark their product up to collect that. That's a pass-through cost where the retailer is essentially going backwards every time that swipe fee goes through on the sales tax portion of it. So I hope I did justice in explaining that. Essentially what this legislation does is says that a swipe fee by a retail, excuse me, by a uh, credit card company cannot be charged on the sales tax portion of the transaction. It is a, an interesting conversation that we've had for quite some time. I do know that we've got folks on both sides of the issue who would like to say a word or two. Um, I must say that I was on the sixth floor yesterday, and, and to quote comedian Bill Murray, it was like cats and dogs getting along with each other as I'm looking at both the bankers and the grocers, the retail community, uh, talking about this issue. And I think we've had some very good conversations. Uh, I think the chairman understands and knows that we do have some presentations on this legislation and uh, uh, would allow them to, to speak at this time, Mr. Chairman. Right. Yes, thank you. And, and without objection, we're going to go out of session and hear from both of them. And the first one we have is, uh, I'm sorry, Rob Eichard with the Tennessee Grocers. And uh, then we will hear from Amy Heslett with the Tennessee Bankers. And I'll give you, have you three minutes each if you don't care, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Rob Eichert from the Tennessee Grocers and Convenience Store Association, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to just say a couple of words about this. I really want to thank Chairman Hawk for bringing this legislation. It has uh, spurred some really good conversations uh, with all of you, and, and I think that the awareness of, of what merchants and retailers go through uh, to serve the state as its number one tax collector uh, has, has become more apparent to to uh, you lawmakers. Uh, it's a conversation that has not been had for, for many, many years. Of course, when uh, vendors' compensation went away 22 years ago, uh, that, that left uh, the merchants of the state as your unpaid partners in the state's revenue system, and, and, and that's okay. Uh, collecting taxes for the state is a cost of doing business here, uh, and it's something that we're honored to do, of course. Um, but, but as you all now know much better, it doesn't uh, come for free. Uh, uh, merchants incur expenses um, from manpower uh, to time to uh, investments in software. Uh, and and the, the, probably the biggest and, and uh, definitely the, the most uh, quickly growing expense is this interchange fee that we pay to the payment card companies. And of course, that, that is part of uh, payment ag agreements that we have with the card companies. Uh, but um, to put it in perspective, when vendors' compensation went away 22 years ago, about 30% of uh, payments were done with payment cards. And today, it's about 75%. So the cost, uh, the interchange fee cost of collecting taxes for the state has just continued to grow and grow. And it grows also because the card companies uh, alter their rates uh, and uh, they, they've consistently gone up and they're, they're going to go up again uh, uh, in, in the near future. So uh, just thank you for uh, uh, hearing us on this and, and we uh, look forward to the conversation going forward. Thank you, and we'll have some follow-up questions when, when you both, after you both present, and uh, would you state your name and who you're with, please? Uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all this morning. I'm Amy Hazlett. I'm with the Tennessee Bankers Association. Our membership includes 170 banks operating in the state, ranging from the smallest community banks to the largest national banks. 
Uh, this legislation to prohibit the interchange fees from being applied to the sales tax portion of retail transactions when a debit or credit card is used would negatively affect every member bank of TBA as well as every other Tennessee-based financial institution that issues credit or debit cards. If passed, this bill would make Tennessee the only state in the country that prohibits interchange fees from being charged on the sales tax portion of credit and debit card transactions. And currently, the technology does not even exist to apply the interchange or the swipe fee to the purchase price only. Additionally, the interchange fees that banks receive are critical to helping banks offset their cost to issue and reissue cards, maintain and service cards for customers, resolve customer disputes, guarantee 100% payment to retailers, and most importantly, cover customers' monetary losses in the instances of fraud. While we're sympathetic to the costs associated with merchants serving as the primary sales tax collectors for the state, uh, we feel that this legislation is not the right solution to address that issue. Um, thank you and I appreciate your time this morning. And thank you for coming. And uh, while we're in session, we have any questions for uh, Chairman Bricken. <clears throat> thank you, panel there. Um, my, my comments are this. Certainly, I am fully support some form of vendor compensation on the interchange swipe fee from the for, for all the merchants. The, certainly, it's very well proven that the use of plastics, debit cards or credit cards, certainly has uh, in the form of whether it um, um, makes you feel either um, empowered, somewhat disconnected or whatever, has greatly increased the size of purchases and, uh, and the revenues of all merchants in the state. So. The, that ship has sailed. I mean, we are in a plastic-dominated society. So it's uh, it, it's kind of a good news, bad news in a way. But um, certainly the form of vendor compensation, I think, certainly needs to be addressed. I don't certainly think it needs to be done through uh, a kind of convoluted interchange fee attachment. So that's it. Thank you. Did either one of you... Want to comment on that, or okay? And Representative Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, I work for a company, and most of our sales are credit card sales. And I totally get it. The interchange fees. In fact, I did a study of our credit card company uh, invoices that we get, and the interchange fees are very, very high. The only thing I can't get over logically is that. When a transaction is financed, the entire transaction is financed, the purchase of the item and the taxes, you don't buy something for $10 and then take 90 cents out of your pocket and pay your taxes, you buy it for $10.90. And therefore, the credit card company is financing the entire transaction. And it just seems logical that, um, you know, that has to be considered the whole amount. And, um, you know, as much as I hate it, that's what seems logical to me. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did either one of you want to talk on that? Okay. No, Chairman Vaughn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Hawk, for bringing this back. Uh, and remarkably, my position hadn't changed. <laughs> um, the Our retailers being collection agents for the state needs to be, they need to receive compensation for that. Um, I, I struggle all the time with um, mandates that are passed down and they're, they're unfunded mandates and that's really what we've done to retailers is we have told them you are going to collect sales tax for the state and you will not receive compensation for them. Uh, and that in a day and time to where our collections are where they are, our, the our economy is booming. They were stripped from the, that compensation at a time when things were dire, um, and so I see this as two se fully separate issues. Uh, whether or not we take from one and give to the other, I think the bankers have, have made a, a valid case for, for the math of the guarantees and, and and charges that they have. But it still doesn't make it right what's happening to the retailers. And I would 
be happy to co-sign with anybody that wants to sponsor a bill, either uh, it's getting late in this season, but particularly next year for vendor compensation to be brought back uh, and recognize the job that they do uh, supporting the state of Tennessee. And so that I can't vote for this, but I could sure vote for something else if I had the opportunity. Thank you. And um, I, I concur with the chairman too. I, th I think that we really, and I, I appreciate, first of all, uh, Chairman Hawk and, and both of you all for coming in. And I know we've been working on this for a long time, for many years, and, and I think that may be the only solution that we kind of finally get to, and it's a great compromise, and, and I hope we can work that out, if not this year, next year, and I would certainly be for that too. Do we have any other questions for our guest? Okay, if not, we're going to go back into session. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, and, and Chairman Vaughn, thank you so much for making mention of another piece of legislation. I look forward to you signing on House Bill 536, which does exactly what you asked uh, to return vendors' compensation, and surely with your influence and, and those on this committee that we'll get that passed this year. So I certainly look forward to, it. once again, House Bill 536. In, I, I truly enjoy the sport of, uh, of the, and the argument, argumentative uh, nature of our work, and I would love to, to comment on, on some of those things that were said on both sides, and, and I probably could have done a little bit better and, and more eloquently describing the situation, but hopefully you got the gist of what we're talking about. Um, I, I do know the technology is a, is a concern. Um, Stating that technology is, does not exist currently is like saying, well, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Technology will follow if we, if we say that this is something we need to do. So technology could and would follow very quickly. That being said, uh, respect for both of the ladies and gentlemen who spoke and the industries who are concerned about this piece of legislation, I would like to officially take the bill off notice and work with Chairman Vaughn and others to, uh, to come up with a, a solution to help uh, the, the folks who are collecting sales taxes across the state of Tennessee very soon. So thank you. Okay, I, and I agree. If we can send a man to the moon, we can, we can work this out. So thank you, and the bill is going to go off notice and go to the special calendar. Thank you. Without objection. Okay, and that brings us up to number nine, House Bill 2546 by Representative Alexander. Do we have a motion? motion. And second? second? And it looks like we have an amendment too. Thank Would you, you um, Chairman, and thank you, Committee. Amendment uh, draft code is 014402. And we do you have a motion on the amendment? And a second. Okay. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. aye. All opposed. The amendment is on the bill. Would you describe the amendment for us, yes. please? As m most of you know in your areas where you live, you have the same problem I have. We have companies that um, have a job opening. People come and apply. They check their box that they've applied. And then when they call them for an interview, two out of 40 will show up. The reason we opened this originally caption bill was to try to figure out how to solve this issue. I know that there is already a system in place where companies can go back to the employment office and say, hey, this person showed up, uh, checked the box, but then wouldn't show up for an interview. But that system is not working. And so we need to relook at this and we need to rework this. I have spoken with Tia and, uh, um, and I've spoken with Chairman Vaughn on many occasions on this over the past few weeks. And we have decided that we would like to take this bill off notice, work on how can we solve this issue with our people not coming back for an interview when they've been called to do so. Um, we have got to get our people back to work. And so I'd like to take this bill off a of notice, work with the department, 
and with the chairman and make it a good bill. Okay, and, and thank you very much. And, and I know the problem and, and I've seen it firsthand and seen people get their card signed uh, just to uh, get it, have it signed, but never, never really want the job or never show back Absolutely. up for the interview. And we've had a lot of that happen in my area and, and all across the state. And, and uh, we appreciate you bringing this done. Well, unemployment, and, I was just say one other thing. Unemployment was designed to take someone from one job to the next. Right. It was not designed to be someone's income. That's right. And thank you. And so without objection, we're going to take House Bill 2546 off notice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, committee. House Bill 2069 by Halsey. Do we have a motion and a second? We have both. We also have an amendment. Chairman Halsey, Ac would you? Actually, there's two of them. Oh, yes, Mr. Chairman, yeah, thank okay. you. Yes, sir. There's an amendment that makes the bill, and then there's a conditional amendment after that. Okay. And what numbers do you have on those? All right. The uh, the conditional amendment is 015079. Do we need to put this in first? That's right. And the, the other one? The amendment that makes the bill is 014721. Yeah, and that's the one we need to put on first. And do we have a motion and a second on it? Okay. And uh, all in favor of that amendment, say aye. aye. All opposed? No, the amendment is adopted. Now we need to do the second one, please. Okay. That's a 15079? Yes. You want me to explain a, that? Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, Tasser did yeah, a we study. Need a motion and a second first. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Mo second? Yes. Yeah, if you want to explain the amendment. Okay. We'll Thank you. T Tasser did a study this past summer on. on the gold depository and they made the point that as long as the state of Tennessee has uh, income tax or not income tax but sales tax on gold bullion rare coins and, and paper money there's no sense in having a depository and so I have a bill that's behind the budget that will do away with sales tax on on uh, gold bullion uh, and and rare coins and paper money so this condition on that amendment says that this gold depository bill, if, if passed, would go into effect 30 days after we get rid of uh, taxes on gold bullion if that comes out of the Finance Committee. So. Okay, let, let's vote on the amendment then. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed. The amendment goes on the bill. So we have the bill as amended now. And do you want to talk about the bill as a whole? Thank you very, very much. And I, I cannot tell you how... Um, exciting it is to be in front of this committee <laughs> with this bill of course i, I don't for, think you've uh, had one come out of this committee yet but i think you've got a winner this year yes for seven <laughs> years i have been working on this seven years ago this assembly uh, voted a hundred percent on a joint resolution to establish a gold depository it has been seven years to get it to this place so i want to explain a little bit about it um uh, gold has a 5,000-year history as money par excellence. Gold is the world's only long-term surviving form of money. And uh, it represents the only financial asset, asset that is not somebody else's liability to repay you. And it's the only metal not consumed. Hence, its use as a reserve asset even among central banks is a pretty big deal. Um, gold is treated as a Tier 1 asset under Basel III regulations, which I had no idea what all that meant, but you banking folks would know. Um, it, those are international banking regulations, and uh, under a, a Tier I asset, it means that there is zero risk. Uh, it's a zero risk asset. And of course, that's why most people believe that if you're going to hold gold, you should do it outside the, the banking system. Um, Monetary and physical risk in this country I don't think has been any more pronounced than it is now. We have a federal government that is $30 trillion in debt. It's hard to even get a head wrapped around that. That's a million million. That's a trillion dollars. And it's, it's an absolutely incredible. And it seems like the next phase that the, the deep state folks uh, are pushing for is, and I've talked about it before, is the rollout of a central bank digital currency and to do away with currency as we know it, uh, followed by uh, universal basic income. Those things scare me. 
and they keep me awake at night thinking what I should do as a representative and a responsibility in this state to do all we can do to protect Tennessee people and keep them solvent. So that's why for seven years we've, we've been working on this. Um, this depository will not cost Tennessee taxpayers one dime. There are investors who want to build it, staff it, maintain it. They want two things in exchange for that. They want to be able to use the word Tennessee State Depository. And they want to be audited by the comptroller's office every year, and they will pay for the audit. So that's why there is no physical note on this at all. It'll be staffed to maintain, but it'll be controlled by the treasurer, uh, the treasurer's office for the state of Tennessee. There are seven gold bullion, or gold bullion depositories in the United States. Most of them have their ties in Europe or another country. Uh, at the end of the day, it gives Tennessee an advantage that other states don't have with a, a currency collapse, hyperinflation, push come to shove. If we went to a digital forced currency, uh, people could still survive. We, have, we would have the option. By the way, Tennessee State, the state of Tennessee, at the direction of the legislature, can put gold, gold, gold bullion in this depository and it doesn't cost us a dime. We get to store it there for nothing. When they get up and running and solvent, the state of Tennessee gets a revenue stream off of it. So I don't think we could ask for anything better than this, and I think this is the time because it's our duty to keep Tennessee people solvent and secure. So, so I, I'm just happy to be here. And we're happy to have you. Uh, do we have any questions for the sponsor? Uh, I'm sorry, Representative Powell. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. So just so I fully understand, so who would be able to put money in the depository? Is it regular Tennesseans, the government? Who, and then how is that the ability to take the money out to, or take, obviously, not money, but gold? So, like, walk, can you kind of walk through that process and what that looks like? Chairman okay. Halsey. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, any, anybody in the public can put gold in, in this depository. As a matter of fact, I have had people in Tennessee who own gold bullion, but they have it stored in other depositories or offshore, and they are excited about this because they want to transfer it here in state where they live. So, yes, anybody in the public can put it in there. The state of Tennessee can also store it in there at no cost. But yes, it, that, that's the whole purpose of it. Representative Powell. So say I'm a, obviously I'm Tennessean, want to put gold in the depository. Um, there's no fee for me to do that. I, uh, how, I mean, how does that, how does that work? Chairman Helson. No, I'm sorry. As a private depositor, yes, there is a fee. That's, yeah. that's how these investors are gonna, gonna make their money back. Yes, there is a fee. For the state of Tennessee, as a legislature, if, if the treasurer puts gold bullion in there, there is no charge. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, so if, if I'm out of state, or you, if, if I'm not a Tennessean, you know, let's say I'm in New York, can you still put money in this depository? Chairman House. You, you certainly can. It's open to the public anywhere. As actually, I, I'm sure that it's open to anybody in the world who wants to store it here. Okay. Representative Powell. And, and my final question, I guess, um, and I'm, I'm leaning towards actually supporting this, so you might have finally struck gold with me in the first bill I voted <laughs> for you in this committee. But anyways, uh, what, <laughs> what, uh, what can, can you tell me if, um, okay, so if I'm in state, I can make it. If I'm out of state, I can make it. The, um, how many other states are doing something similar to this, and are, are we competing with other states? Is this something that other states have and we just don't? Thank you, the, thank you for the question. Yes, there are seven gold depositories in the United States. Actually, Texas built their first one in 2018, and they're building a second one now. But anybody anywhere can deposit, and there is a fee for it, but... but Yes, you, you, we would compete with other states, but, but uh, the, the folks who want to invest in this know that. Representative Powell. 
And sorry, one last comment here. And, and again, I, I think I'm going to support your legislation, but I do want to say that, um, I mean, technically there is a private marketplace. If I wanted to, I could put my money into a, a bank safety deposit box, right, if I had gold. Um, and so, you know, I just think it's a little bit ironic that one bill where we're talking about savings and people being able to take care of themselves, we defeat it. But here we are talking about government creating a depository for gold um, for savings. So I just, again, I go back to this. I think that the, your bill as it's written is a, is a, you know, is a worthy task and worth the government taking on because ultimately, you know, I agree it, gold is a pretty good hedge against a lot of things for people as an investment. Um, and quite frankly, I wish I had purchased more interest in gold. Um, as we continue to see different, the price has gone up quite a bit. But I just think, again, going back to some other legislation is, is you know, these types of things we need to look at because this is a good option for Tennesseans to have. And essentially, it's Tennessee getting in the business of gold uh, depository. Yes. And so, you know, I think it's worthwhile. For that reason, I, I will support your bill. Thank you. Jeremy, how, do you thank have a comment? Com and that's the reason why we have to get rid of the tax on gold bullion. We're losing tens of millions of dollars going out of Tennessee to purchase gold. And we're only one of seven states left that uh, that still tax it with an income yeah. tax. But um, I, I wish you could get us back uh, Chairman Halsey, on, on the gold standard, if you could do that with oh, the U.S. and that'd be wonderful. Yeah, that, that would be golden. Uh, Chairman Bricken. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for fellow members, if you would go to the Texas uh, Depository website, it's, it's a fascinated website. Uh, and obviously, I, you can go around Tennessee and look at all the daggum storage buildings we have in Tennessee. This country is a storage people, I guess. I'm not sure how to say it. Uh, we we store every damn thing. Um, the um, yeah, hoarders probably. But uh, you know, of course, the comment right here: Tennessee citizens do have a, a way of storing um, uh, their uh, gold and silver and all in in, in banks and and safety deposit boxes. But the sizes of bank safety deposit boxes probably aren't intended for the size of these gold depositories. I have n n no trouble if a, a private sector company thinks it's, uh, they can lay out a business plan to make it profitable in Tennessee to create a storage facility for us. Um, and I guess my only question, does Texas exempt uh, gold from sales tax sales in Texas? Chairman Halsey. I, I, yes, I believe they do. There, like I said, there's only seven states that do not, and we're one of them. And Mississippi actually just passed in their legislature to do over it, away with it. So now all the states that surround us don't have that tax. But yes, I'm I'm, I'm pr pretty sure they do. I'm sorry. So, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Brigham. Uh, final question. So, way I understand it, if we would pass this, this bill would only become effective if we pass the sales tax exemption, and that's running under another bill, right? Is that correct? That's exactly Chairman correct. Chairman House. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, just a quick question. I want to make sure I got this right. It it sounds like that your your bill uh, allows for, for private investors to use private capital to build this um, and that uh, they will charge citizens a, a fee to do it. And, and the only thing public I've really heard so far is that the state can store gold there for free and the comptroller audits it. It sounds like this is a private venture. I'm just wondering why we're even running legislation to do this. Why don't your private investors just go start one? Chairman Hulse. Thank you for the question. It It is, except it's overseen in the bill. It is overseen completely by the treasurer, the Tennessee treasurer. And they are using the word Tennessee State Gold Bullion Deposit or Gold Depository. That's those two things make it a a joint venture with the state of Tennessee and uh, and the depository. But the treasurer has, like I say, in the bill, the the words are. The Tennessee Bullion Depository is established as an agency of this state in the office of the state of treasurer, and under B, at all times, the assets held by the depository are under the custody and control of the state treasurer. Um, 
by the way, the comptroller's lawyers is who wrote the bill. Um, been working on this a long time. And if this proceeds, then my next task is to convince the legislature that we have to purchase gold bullion for the state to, to store in here. Uh, so that, that will be the, ne the next program. That one may not go as well as this one. Uh, any other questions for the sponsor? Do we have a question on the bill? And I've got a question. All in favor of House Bill, just lost it, 2069, going on to full commerce, say aye. Aye. All opposed? I cannot we'll tell you clear. how thankful I am. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, and without objection, we're going to roll the two amendments into one when it goes. Okay. Okay, we're, we're running up on the clock. I'm sorry. We're... Um, been told that we're going to have to uh, leave here in a minute because we've got another committee coming in. So uh, without objection, we're going to adjourn and all the bill, all the remaining bills that are on here will be heard next week. Sorry, coach. <laughs>